Um, welcome everyone to this webinar on chemical first aid and thank you for joining us this lunchtime. I'm Claire Weisel, the Marketing and Communications Manager from Composites UK and I'll be facilitating this afternoon session. We are recording this webinar and we'll share the link with you as soon as it's available. Our speaker today is Kate Joy, who is the Business Development Manager at DIFEX. If you have any questions for Kate at all, please submit these using the Q&A facility at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'll then read these out at an appropriate point or at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will hand over to Kate to begin. Lovely. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks very much, Claire, for that introduction and to Composites UK for putting this together for us today. And thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, we're going to talk about chemical first aid today. So um, hopefully by the end of the session, we'll understand what chemicals can cause us an injury. We'll have an understanding of how those chemical injuries develop, how these chemicals affect us. Um, we'll review our different first aid options, and we've got three to talk about today. We'll understand the difference between passive washing and active washing, and hopefully I'll give you a few tips on handling a, a chemical incident if that occurred. Um, as we go through the presentation, just a warning, there are a few pictures um, depicting chemical injuries. Um, so if you're in, just had your lunch or you're eating your lunch, please feel free to look away. We'll try to remind you before they appear. Um, and I'm going to start with a couple of pictures. And we'll, we'll make a start. So chemical injuries, as I say, a couple of pictures coming up. Um, these are the consequences. They are a little bit gory, but there's no real apology from me because this is the reality. If we come into contact with a chemical and our first aid isn't effective, these are the types of injuries we can encounter. We've got here a skin burn due to an acid and an eye injury due to an alkali, sodium hydroxide. So it just goes to show that chemicals are both ends of that pH scale have the ability to cause us chemical injury. And these injuries can affect our skin and our eyes. The type of chemicals that can cause this injury are our corrosives and irritants. You're probably very familiar with this signage, corrosives on the left, irritants on the right. Red, white, and black is our current signage. The orange and black is the older nomenclature, but it's important to be aware of both. If we see this sign, this chemical has the ability to cause us chemical harm. And we need to think about our safe systems of work and our PPE before we start handling these chemicals. Now, the difference between corrosives and irritants, corrosives are those highly concentrated acids or alkalis. They have a really strong reaction with our tissues and the effects they have on our tissue without effective first aid will be irreversible. And by irreversible, I mean we're going to need the intervention of a surgeon to carry out skin grafting or corneal grafting to overcome those injuries. Irritants tend to be things more like solvents and oils. They do have a weaker reaction with our tissues and generally those effects are reversible. We'll get soreness, we'll get redness, um, but generally our body can self-repair. However, get our first aid right and that whole process is much quicker, much less painful. I will concentrate on corrosives and irritant effects of chemicals today, but we do need to bear in mind when we're working with chemicals, they can have more than one risk. For example, I could have a chemical that was corrosive and toxic or one that was irritant and harmful. So it's important to understand all the hazards of the chemicals that we do work with. Now, chemical injuries, and I do use the term chemical injury because I want to differentiate um, in the burns sector. We, when we do burns first aid, we often talk about using water as our first aid method, and it can give a little bit of confusion about the processes that happen with these different types of burns. A thermal burn is just an exchange of energy, essentially, from our burn from our heat source, sorry, into our tissues. The chemical injury is very different. With a chemical injury, we've got an aggressor within our chemical that seeks out a target molecule within our tissues. It causes cellular destruction of that molecule, and that's how our chemical injury develops. How serious our chemical injury is depends on the number of cells that we modify and actually the type of modification that takes place. And a chemical injury will keep developing all the time that we've got a chemical aggressor present and a target molecule for it to react with. Now, I said that we've got two types of chemical that causes our injuries, our corrosives and our irritants and that we've got chemical aggressors that cause that damage. And there are six main aggressors that can cause these damages. So the first of those is our acids. With things like sulfuric acid, nitric acid, hydrofluoric acid, hydrochloric acid, it's that H plus iron that's causing the damage. 
The H plus ion seeks out proteins in our tissues. It causes coagulative necrosis. Our chemical injury develops. The other end of the pH scale, we've got our alkalis. With those, it's that hydroxide, that OH minus ion that causes the damage. So these are things like your sodium hydroxides, your potassium hydroxides. That OH minus ion seeks out fats in our tissues. It causes liquefactive necrosis. And again, our chemical injury develops. Quite difficult to stop hydroxide injuries because they dissolve the fats, actually saponifiates, where you get that typical soapy feeling on your tissues if you come into contact with these. They start to liquefy those fats. It's a bit of a chain reaction. They creep along in that fatty layer under our tissues. Difficult to stop. And it's probably the most common injury that gets seen within the NHS. Other aggressors that we've got are our oxidizing agents. We've got our reducing agents. We've got our collating agents and we've got our solvents. So six different aggressive chemical reactions that can take place. So it means when we start to talk about our first aid, our first aid has to be able to stop all six of those aggressive reactions to be effective. Now, chemicals don't do us any harm until they come into contact with us. And that's why we're always reminding our colleagues to be wearing their PPE. If we've got our gloves on, if we're wearing our safety glasses, if we're wearing a chemical suit, if um, appropriate, we keep that chemical away from our tissues, we stop that chemical injury occurring. But if something goes wrong and we know accident happened, if those chemicals come into contact with our tissue, it starts to penetrate through the protective outer layer. And as it gets into the deeper layers, it finds that um, target molecule it wants to react with, causes that cellular destruction and our chemical injury occurs. The deeper a chemical penetrates, the more serious our chemical injury is going to be. And that rate of penetration could be anything from a few seconds to a few minutes. And there are a few factors that affect that rate of penetration. The first of those is actually the type of chemical and its concentration. Generally, the more concentrated a chemical is, the more aggressive it is, the faster it will penetrate into our tissues. The second factor that can affect that rate of penetration is actually the temperature of a chemical. If we heat chemicals up, they become more reactive. If they're more reactive, they tend to be more aggressive, they penetrate our tissues more quickly. The third factor that's going to affect that rate of penetration is actually how long a chemical remains in contact with our tissue. The longer it's into contact, the more opportunity it has to penetrate. Now we know that penetration is key to the severity of our injury. If we can limit penetration, we can limit the seriousness of our lesion. But there's only one factor of those three that affect that rate that we can have any effect on. And that's actually the length of time the chemical is in contact with our tissue. So as a responder or a first aider, what we're aiming to do to remove chemical from the surface of the tissue as quickly as possible to limit penetration, thereby limit the severity of our injury. And that's where first aid started really. And this is the first of our first aid options and that's to use water. And water can remove chemical from the surface of the tissue to try to avoid the development of the injury. Now water does that in two ways. The first one is a mechanical washing effect. So large quantities of water flushing over the surface of the tissue, flush that chemical away, we limit the penetration, limit the severity of our injury. Now when you look at your safety data sheets for your chemicals, You'll often find it says wash with copious quantities of water. It's a bit of a woolly statement, but this does get defined. There's a standard called EN 15154, and that defines what we need from our emergency safety showers. So if we have fixed and plumbed in dredge showers or eye wash points, and that states that if we work with class one corrosives, that shower should operate at a rate of 60 litres a minute for 15 minutes for our skin. Um, for an eye plumbed in eye wash, that's six litres a minute for 15 minutes. That's the standards we need to be adhering to. So that's a very fast flow rate of water. We're talking about 900 litres there in that 15 minutes in a drenched shower. And it is that fast speed, and that large volume of water that flushes the chemical away. The second thing that water can do is to actually dilute a chemical. So we have our pH scale that's a measure of how acid or alkali a chemical is. At either end of that scale, our chemicals are really concentrated. They penetrate our tissue really quickly. If we can actually reduce that concentration down towards a central pH neutral point, pH 7, then we can reduce the aggressiveness of the chemical. 
we can limit its penetration. And during that washing process, it's unlikely that we're going to get down to pH 7. If we think about it, um, our water's rarely pH 7. Most sites I visit, the pH is about 7.5. Our skin's got a pH down nearer 5.5. So unlikely we'll ever get to pH 7. But what we aim to do is dilute the chemical into what we call a safe physiological zone. That's a range between 5.5 and 9. If we get a chemical into that range, it no longer has the ability to aggress our tissues. We limit our penetration. Again, we're limiting the severity of our injury. And water is pretty much a universal product. It acts the same way on all aggressive chemicals. So one stop shop, I will say limited risk of mistakes because there are a number of chemicals that the faculty of pre-hospital care don't recommend that we irrigate with water. Those chemicals include concentrated sulfuric acid, concentrated hydrochloric acid, and chemicals like lime. We get a big exothermic reaction if we add water to those. Um, so uh, something we want to avoid. So water, you know, is, is very useful. It's a one stop shop. And to say that same one, all aggressive chemicals, it will because it will mechanically wash and it will dilute. So the statement's correct from that point of view. But we do have some limitations with water. If we understand what they are, then we can get the best from our first aid if we are going to use water. Highly concentrated chemicals, so something like 50% caustic soda, phenol, 98% sulfuric acid, penetrate our tissue almost immediately. Once that chemical's penetrated, it doesn't really matter how much I flush across the surface, I can't stop the action that's taking place in the deeper layers of our tissues. So because of that speed of penetration, often even if we follow our protocols for washing with water, we don't walk away with that injury. We need some form of secondary care. Because of that speed of penetration of these concentrated chemicals, that EM 1554 standard I mentioned relating to our drenched showers states, if we're going to use water, we must start washing immediately. The ANSI standard gives us 10 seconds, but it has to be an extremely quick response with water. That can give rise to problems in a production environment. Um, you know, getting that response, getting to an emergency drenched shower within that very short space of time can be difficult that chemicals penetrating um, until we start that washing process. It can give us some issues as well in cross-contamination, getting your colleague to that shower. We need to be really careful um, for our own safety. So if we do have an incident, responder safety is as important as our casualties. So make sure there's no cross-contamination. Think about wearing your PPE if we're going to assist them, make their way to an emergency shower. When we do start water running in this type of incident, a little bit of thought about what's happening because initially we can start to move quite concentrated chemicals across the body. So have a little bit of thought about water flows when you're irrigating. Um, good example, if I had chemical in my right eye, if I started to flush water across the face to try and flush that eye out, I'm going to take chemical towards the left eye, um, sensitive area, I mean, spread that area of injury. So think a little bit, keep that flow going away from those sensitive areas. Don't leave a casualty sat on the floor. The solution that collects around him is going to be quite corrosive. We don't want to leave him sat in a corrosive puddle. And again, think about your own safety. Anything splashing off our casualty may well be corrosive. So watch those cross-contamination risks. A few other factors we need to think about with water. Those emergency drenched showers generally mains fed, often trace heated to stop from freezing, um, but running on cold water. We're going to require our colleague to stand under cold running water for 15 minutes. It's a really difficult thing to carry out. So if you're going to have to put somebody in this situation, maybe a bit of a battle to keep them in that cold water for 15 minutes. You know what it's like at home. You know, you're having a nice shower in the morning. Somebody turns a hot tap on somewhere else and all of a sudden you get a cold deluge. You jump out pretty quick. Oh, just consider that you're going to have to kind of, you know, persuade your casualty to remain under that cold water for 15 minutes. But we do also need to monitor them for the risks of hypothermia. As we call their core body temperature down, we do introduce those risks. And any casualty who has burnt tissue, burnt tissue doesn't have the ability to maintain temperature. So they're already a, a hypothermia risk. Other consideration particularly relates to decontaminating eyes. Um, it can be quite difficult to decontaminate an eye. Think about, I was talking about being in a shower just now. If you're in the shower in the morning and you get soap or shampoo into the eye, it stings immediately. 
the automatic response your eye makes is to shut tight. It's called blepharospasm. It's designed to protect the eye. Your eye shuts tight, try to limit any more chemical getting in. But it's difficult to override. You know, if you're going to have to flush somebody's eye for 15 minutes, it's likely that we're going to have to hold their eyelids apart, assist that process. It'll be really difficult to decontaminate. And we often don't get reliable results, even if we follow the protocol. So even with immediate washing with water for 15 minutes, we may not get the result we require. This was a site, had regular deliveries of sulfuric acid, um, looked at those hazards, installed an emergency drench shower at the delivery point, trained everybody in its use. Driver turned up, coupled his tanker up and the coupling failed and somebody got splashed from the waist down with sulfuric acid. They went straight to the emergency drench shower, stepped on the plate, started the water running, removed contaminated clothing from the area so they could rinse it fully. But despite that immediate response, didn't walk away with that injury. The speed that that chemical penetrated meant flushing the surface had limited effect. That chemical was already in the deeper layers causing that damage. So he didn't walk away with that injury, was off work for six months. So we can do the right thing, but still not get good results. And there is another factor that causes this with water, and it's something called hypotonicity. Odd concept, this one, bear with me a moment. So hypo means lack of. So hypotonicity is lack of pressure. If you think about us, we're made up of a number of solutions, blood, sweat, tears. They've all got salts dissolved into them. That makes us a concentrated being. Water has got very little dissolved into it. It's got a lack of concentration compared to us. It's hypotonic. Now, osmosis states that water will move from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. So water's naturally attracted into our tissues. You will have seen this. If you ever get the luxury of a nice long soak in the bath, you'll notice that you get puffy and wrinkly fingers and toes. That's this process of, of osmosis, water's being drawn into the tissues. You can actually see that on your fingers and toes. So let's relate this back to our first aid. Chemicals contacted our tissue, it started to penetrate. We start to wash with water, but due to this hypertonicity, water's attracted into our tissues. As that water is drawn in, it's going to assist the penetration of any chemical on the surface and any chemical that's already penetrated, we could potentially push deeper. And we know that the deeper the chemical penetrates, the more serious our injury is. It's something that's known as the washing effect, and it is one of the drawbacks that we have with water. For that reason, we've got a second solution that we often use in managing uh, chemical incidents and particularly for our eyes and that's saline and you may not have thought about why we're using saline it comes in sterile bottles that's obviously often what people think you know we've got a sterile solution it's more effective for the eyes but the reason we're using saline is because it improves our first aid now let's think about our eyes our eyes are really susceptible to chemical injury you know that you can wash your hands with soap all day it doesn't sting same soap in the eye stings immediately that protective outer layer on our eyes less effective than that on our skin so our chemicals penetrate into our eyes more easily and the consequence of a chemical injury to the eye if we destroy sight cells is a loss of vision so it can be a catastrophic result so eyes really sensitive to injury we need to protect them so we improved our first aid by using saline by adding 0.9 percent salt to water we create a solution that's isotonic. It has the same um, osmotic pressure. So if we use saline to wash an eye, we flush the chemical away, but it's not attracted in. We take away that washing effect. So saline is our second washing solution. The advantages are we've still got that mechanical washing effect. It is still a single protocol, but it's an isotonic solution. So we've got that same osmotic pressure, not going to assist penetration in those really sensitive eyes. It can't have any effect on the chemical that's already penetrated though, it can only flush chemical away from the surface, it's what we call a passive wash, so water and saline are both passive washes. Now amphoteric solutions are our third option with first aid and they're now what the Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care and the British Burns Association recommend as first line um, decontamination they've got a hierarchy so amphoteric solutions are first 
hypertonic saline, then saline, and then water. Water is our final choice. Amphoteric solutions are slightly different. They're still liquids. They retain that mechanical washing effect, but they're an active wash. They've got a chemical absorbent within the solution, which immediately stops the aggressiveness of the chemical. And in the case of diphotyrene, which is the amphoteric solution that's on the market, it's hypertonic. So just to give you a little bit more detail on how it works differently. So an active wash. So the diphotyrene molecule that's in the amphoteric solution has the ability to attract, bind and render harmless the aggressors of the chemicals we talked about. So we've got those six different aggressors, acids, alkalis, oxidizers, reducers, collators and solvents. That diphotyrene molecule is amphoteric. It has the ability to work at both ends of the pH scale with all of those different aggressors. So that OH minus ion, that hydroxide ion that we talked about from that alkali, gets attracted to one site on the molecule. We bind it, render it harmless. The acid is attracted to a different site on the molecule. That H plus ion again gets bound and rendered harmless, stops it having any action on our tissues. I did do this training with some doctors the other day, and one of them said to me, Diphotyrene is just like Pac-Man then. It comes along and gobbles up the baddies, which isn't a bad way of thinking about things. But that ability to grab hold and stop that corrosive having any action on our tissues gives us a number of benefits. So firstly, we're going to need much less solution. We've gone from a passive wash just trying to flush the chemical away to an active wash where we bind the aggressor. That means that our tissue goes back to that safe physiological zone really quickly, it means we limit the severity of the injury quickly, it means we can lose less solution. It means that our runoff is non-corrosive. So that's safer for both the casualty, we're not going to spread the area of injury, and it's safer for a responder because we don't have those cross-contamination risks. It means you don't need to know which corrosive or irritant you've come into contact with because we've got the ability to bind all the different aggressors. It means our washing process is much quicker. and We take away the risks of hypothermia and we've got another benefit. Although diphotyrene is not a painkiller, it's not analgesia, if we stop the corrosive action, that aggressive action on our tissues, we can actually limit the pain that our casualty feels. So we reduce our casualties pain. So we've got a much calmer casualty to manage. It's much easier to get an effective decontamination. We've got a much simpler system to deal with. Now, hypertonicity. So we've talked about water being hypotonic, having a lack of pressure. We've talked about saline having the same pressure, isotonic solution. This amphoteric solution is hypertonic, so it's got a greater concentration than us. So if we think back to that osmotic process, this time the water is going to move towards that greater concentration. So we, we actually create a very gentle draw of fluid from our tissues when we wash with diphotyrene. That means we can actually draw out any penetrated chemical, bind those aggressors, return that tissue quickly back to that safe physiological zone. That ability to draw that penetrated chemical out also means that we have longer to respond. So with water, we have that immediate response, or at least within those first 10 seconds. With diphotyrene, you've got up to a minute, you've got a full, six, full 60 seconds to respond, to um, manage that injury, walk away without injury, regardless of chemical or concentration. So we've opened up our response window. That means it's much easier to equip a production facility as well because we've got longer to actually start that washing process. Just to show you what's going on inside. Um, so these were some experiments done by Professor Schrager. He's an ophthalmologist. He changed his hospital's procedures to use diphotyrene rather than water a number of years ago. He's got a study now of over 2000 cases. Um, he was getting great results, but he actually wanted to show people what was happening within those eyes. So these are rabbit eyes. It's not live animal testing. The rabbits have entered the food chain and this is done ex vivo in the laboratory. Um, but he took two eyes. He contaminated them both with two and a half percent sodium hydroxide solution. He left that in contact with the eye for 60 seconds um, and then washed with um, either saline or water. Sorry either water or diphotyrene. So eye top left was washed with water, eye bottom right was washed with, sail with diphotyrene. Um, eye top left, you can see we've got that cloudy appearance to the cornea. 
And to show what was going on inside, Professor Schrager used something called OCT, Optical Coherence Tomography. It's what you get now when you pay your extra tenor at Specsavers. They have a look at the condition of your cornea, see how healthy it is. So those are the two images in the middle. The eye that was washed with water, we can see the chemicals penetrated. We've got cellular destruction, but that cloudy appearance, a loss of sight cells. And we can see that in the middle. That's a slice through the cornea. We can see how that chemicals penetrated the full depth of the cornea, caused that cellular destruction. With the eye that was washed with diphosphorine, we can see we've got a completely clear cornea. That chemical has been kept at the outer layer of the eye. We've got no destruction in the deeper layers. We've not destroyed those sight cells. We've retained the vision. Hopefully that gives you a little idea of what's going on. There's one other benefit of using an active washing solution as well, and that gives us a benefit in a delayed response. So if somebody comes to you having had a splash that they thought was innocuous, and then 10 minutes later, say it, it's really starting to sting. These amphoteric solutions, diphosphorine, can have a benefit up to 24 hours after a splash. Now, these products are medical devices. They're not miracle devices. They're not going to repair damaged tissue. But as soon as we start using them, we stop those reactions taking place. We return that tissue back to a safe physiological zone. We limit the damage that occurs. So to, just to give you an example of that, this was a lady who was actually attacked with ammonia. We're seeing a number of corrosive attacks, aren't we, in the UK over the last few years. Um, so this lady had ammonia sprayed in her face. Um, she made her own way to hospital, took her an hour to get there. She had no first aid um, in the process of, of getting to hospital. On arrival at hospital, her eye had um, visual acuity of 220. And it was classified as a Roper Hall grade four burn to the eye. That is as serious as it gets. That Roper Hall scale run, runs one to four. An ophthalmologist seeing an injury like that would normally think about corneal grafting. Um, but at the moment, that pH is way above that safe zone of nine. This is an alkali. It's way above that. So you can't carry out corneal grafting at this point. The graft would be destroyed by the chemical. So he washed her eye with diphosphorine, washed her immediately with an eye wash bottle, and then over the period of an hour, kept dosing the eye every few seconds just to work to pull that penetrated chemical out, return that tissue back to that safe physiological zone. At the end of that hour, pH was back down below nine. He could see a reasonable blood supply to the cornea. So rather than the risks that we have with um, corneal grafting, he decided that pH was back down into that um, safe zone fairly quickly. He would opt for a conservative method. He gave her ascorbic acid drops to promote healing. He gave her um, antibiotics to guard against infection and just allowed the, L the eye to self-repair. Within six months, this is the same eye. Her visual acuity was back at 1420, was at 1620 by the year, end of the year. So that ability of the amphoteric solution to stop that reaction taking place as soon as we start washing it, even in a delayed response, means we limit the damage and we can then get on with our healing processes much quickly. The advantage with the amphoteric solutions as well, they meet those EN1515-4 standards, but they're not plumbed in or fixed solutions. So we can adapt them to the hazards that we see. We need much smaller volumes. So again, make, gives us a lot more flexibility. Um, and we now have longer to respond. They do come in um, similar formats to those we're used to seeing. So particularly um, eye washes for the eyes, makes that decontamination really simple. And we've got aerosols for managing decontamination of the skin. Um, all of the kit is completely portable. So we've even got a full body shower that's completely portable. So if we have an incident on site, rather than having to get somebody from a fixed and plumbed in point, we can take the shower to them. Um, it means that you can be flexible on site as well. You know, imagine if you had a delivery once a month of chemicals, rather than having to have a fixed and plumbed in shower outside that we need to, to maintain, to flush, to carry out Legionella testing on, we can actually take a, a portable shower outside, guard against that risk while the delivery is happening, and then bring the shower back inside to look after another area of the factory. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. If you've got hazards that move around site, um, I've got a, a large automotive company that um, has a chemical they dip the doors in to remove the oxides before they paint so that we end up with a nice shiny car. Um, because they move those chemicals in large volumes around their factory, um, they've actually attached a shower to the forklift truck. So wherever the chemical goes, the first aid can move with it. So 
get a lot of flexibility from this option. It doesn't have to be plumbed in and it's maintenance free. Um, so benefits of a, an amphoteric solution. It is recommended by the Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care and the Burns Association. It's effective on all of those different aggressors we've talked about. We've opened up our response time. So rather than an immediate wash, we've now got a minute to start our washing. It's more comfortable, it's a much quicker wash. And we do get a benefit, a proven benefit in that delay wash, which saline or water can't offer. Now, dealing with an incident, um, you know, if we have an incident on site, regardless of which washing solution we want to use, the first thing that we need to think about, if an incident occurs, we move ourselves away from the danger. We shout for help. It's not going to be an incident we can deal with on our own. We need to remove contaminated clothing from the area before we decontaminate. A little bit of thought about how you remove clothing. If we've got something like a t-shirt or a jumper, you need to be really careful. We're not going to take that up across the face where we might take contaminated um, uh, chemical across those sensitive areas. So we need to be able to cut or tear shoulder seams, pull that clothing down, and then we can carry on our decontamination. So you may want to think about having things like tough cut scissors and gloves available to your first aiders to assist that clothing. If clothing started to adhere to an area, don't try to pull that away, cut around that adhered area. Um, but remove as much as we can because that clothing will keep chemical against the skin. We want to start our rinsing as quickly as possible. Um, those rinsing protocols with water, it's immediate. With the amphoterics, we've got a minute. When we're talking about eyes, we need to be careful about contact lenses as well. Um, initially, a contact lens will protect the surface of the cornea, but very quickly that chemical can get underneath and get trapped against the surface of the cornea. So if you have got a casualty, with um, a chemical in the eye, don't delay decontamination. Start that rinsing process as quickly as possible. Ask them the question about contact lenses. If they say they're wearing contact lenses, make sure their hands are decontaminated and ask the casualty to remove their own lens. Don't recommend a first aider of ferrets around in somebody's eye to try and remove a lens. Um, if they're not able to remove their own lens, you could try a, a fast flush that may flush your lens away. If we think that lens has started to react, and that can happen with a number of chemicals, they may react and, and cause the chemical to weld to the surface of the eye, then that's a job for an ophthalmologist. We need to get that person's casualty as quickly as possible, um, keeping up that rinsing process if we can um, to try and deal with that chemical trapped under the lens, um, but never delay starting the washing process. When we talk about decontaminating somebody as well, just think about where we start our decontamination. If we've got a full body contamination, we're going to start at the top. Number of reasons, you know, flush chemical down, gravity will help us. Secondly, um, that's where our sensitive areas are. We want to prioritise eyes, face and hands. Eyes, loss of sight is catastrophic for somebody, so they're our first priority. The face, if we get a facial um, change, that can be life changing for somebody. And hands, if we get scarring to our hands, that contracts, takes away fine motor skills really quickly. So again, can really affect somebody's quality of life. They tend to be the items that are uncovered as well. So it's really easy to start that decontamination process while we're removing um, clothing from other areas. But we do make sure we decontaminate everybody, everywhere. Um, once we've finished our decontamination, um, it's likely your casualty is suddenly going to realise that they're naked in front of all their colleagues. It will cause panic um, and they're likely to grab some clothing to put back on. Please don't let them put their contaminated clothing on. It's often useful to have something on site as a cover up. You know, cotton sheet, paper boiler suit could be in your first aid kit just for a bit of modesty once the situation's been dealt with. And regardless of what decontamination method used, we always recommend you seek medical advice at the end of um, the situation. With first aiders, we're not medics. It's good to have that clearance just to make sure um, that we've dealt with all of that chemical. So hopefully that's given you a few pointers. We now know we've got three options for our chemical first aid. Um, Obviously, I work in the area of amphoteric solutions, so if you do need any further information, you feel free to contact me, answer any questions. But does anybody have any questions uh, following on from what we've said today? Thank you very much, Kate. That's uh, 
Really good to see clever solutions like with the forklift truck having a portable shower. It could really be the thing that makes all the difference in those situations, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so does, does anybody have any questions at all for Kate? Um, none has come through during the presentation. Um, as we said, the recording will be re available. So if you do rewatch it and have a question that comes to mind, um, you're welcome to either contact Kate directly or we can pass queries on. Um, but we'll just give it a couple of seconds in case anybody's in the middle of typing something. <laughs> No, Vince is just saying that it was a great session. Thank you very much. <laughs> Vince, much appreciated. Okay, nothing's coming through, Kate. So with that, shall we wrap up the session? Yeah, thank um, you very much, everybody. And, and thank you, Claire, for your help on the technical side. It's been brilliant. No problem at all. And thanks again to you, Kate, and to everybody for attending. And we'll hopefully see you all again soon. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Bye-bye.